last part of this today event, and uh, the last part will be uh, still about uh, funding schemes uh, available for you in Europe, different uh, agencies who can uh, help you to fund your PhD or your postdoc. And we start first with uh, Mr. Gia, uh, who is going to present an incentive uh, specific to France. So Mr. Gia, if you can um, start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So this is really my pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce you to the, uh, the CIF program, which is a um, typical French program which allows uh, a company to receive some fundings from the French government to uh, found um, some PhD research. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, to present you how does it works, actually. So um, I'm not sure I'm going to follow the, this, this plan, but uh, basically I will give you a, a short presentation about what is a CIF, uh, what does it stand for, and also what are the key data that we have been collecting since a few years. And, um, and then I will show you how does it works and uh, finally, what are the benefits for the PhD student, for the company, and for the academic lab? So basically, um, the first question should be, why a PhD in a private company? Usually, a PhD student is uh, developing uh, he or her research in, a, in an academic lab. Um, and this, um, this question is very fundamental, uh, and basically, the, the real key question about the CIFR. Uh, there are many reasons to get a PhD in a private uh, research and development department. First, uh, it provides to the company a high level of, um, of specialization. Um, we know that a PhD student has a specific uh, way to approach um, problems and finding solutions. S slightly different from an uh, engineer. So the, the behavior, the way a PhD student is, is uh, looking at uh, a problem and finding solutions is very different compared to any kind of other uh, research approach. Um, it also gives um, to the company the ability to get, uh, to get access to some research fields or research topics which are not basically uh, in, their, in their deep uh, research uh, domain. So it allows the company to be open to uh, uh, external field of, uh, of research. We also know that um, uh, we expect that a PhD student has a high level of uh, expression in terms of writing and uh, oral expression uh, in English or in uh, different countries. And I will come back to the international side of the CIF program. So CIF uh, stands for French name, so I try to make a uh, approximative translation. So CIF stands for this is an agreement, this is a convention, so this is an agreement between a private company and the French government to, uh, to employ um, um, a PhD student doing he or her research in the R&D department of the private company together with an academic lab. So the PhD student will share he or her time between the private, um, the private uh, institution and the academic lab. So, the, this program has been created in, in 1981, so it's like 36 more years of existence. Uh, since the beginning, we have, been, um, uh, we, I comp we have been working together with about 27,000 students doing uh, a PhD research based on the CIF program. Um, today, we have 4,200 ongoing projects which is a kind of doctoral school quite large, if you see the number of students connected to this program. Um, every year we have uh, 1,400 1, new projects coming, and uh, the role of RNRT and the role of my department is to, to, to get all the candidates. We have about uh, 1,700 new candidates every year, so we make a selection. We, we just have one quota, which is the number of allowed CIF from the French government, which is 1,400. So beside that, uh, there is no specific criteria between one project to another one, except the quality of the project, the level of, of um, competencies of the students, and the ability of the company to welcome the student in a good way. Okay. Um, this program has no nationality conditions, so it, 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 it is really open to all 
uh, all uh, nationalities. Uh, as an example, I think I will come back a little bit later, but for example, we have 24% of students coming from foreign countries. So it's uh, three quarter of French students, but there is one quarter of international students getting benefits of this program. Um, we cover all scientific areas um, in terms of um, academic uh, uh, doctoral schools. So we do mathematics, physics, chemistry, uh, medicine, um, law, uh, language, uh, um, um, sticks, whatever. There is all types of, um, of um, scientific areas. And we also cover all sectors of activity. And I will show you some data about that. So, <coughs> if there's only one slide I should, I should share with you, it should, it should be this one. Here you have the way that the SLIF is organized. So you have, actually, you, you do have three main actors. You do have the PhD student, which is actually an actual employee of the company. We do have a company, a private company, is not necessarily a French company, but the company has to do business in France. So it could be a foreign uh, company or industry, but it has to be based. It has to be based in France. Companies should be seen as more than uh, industrial companies. It could be obviously a small company. It could be a big company, big groups. It could be um, it could be any kind of institutions like a museum, like a national park. It could be um, it could be um, uh, laws organizations. It could be uh, it could be syndicates, it could be uh, unions, sorry, it could be unions. So any kind of, I would say, social economic institution doing any kind of business in France can, uh, is, uh, are allowed to get the CIF program uh, subvention. And the third one is the French Academic Lab. And uh, when I will cover the international side, I will show you that this is a French lab, but it could be also an, uh, a foreign laboratory coming from another country. So, you do have those three actors, and uh, how does it work? So, the company receives some money from the French government, and this is the role of RNIT to manage this money. The money is uh, 1,400, uh, 1,400 euro, 40, 000, sorry, euros per year. So, for three years long, it's 42,000 euros that the French organization, the French, uh, this is the high educational and the research uh, ministry. Uh, this ministry is given to the company 42,000 euros during three years. That's the money we give to the company. In reverse, the company employs the PhD student. And the PhD student is, a, is, em, is, em, is employed for three years, and it comes a regular employees. There is no difference except that this employee will share he or her time between the R&D lab of the institution and an academic lab. Don't forget that the CIF is really to make this connection between academic lab and private institution. And then the French academic laboratory will provide knowledge, um, competencies, will uh, work together with the PhD to create this research together. And of course, there is also a connection between the company and the French academic lab, which is based on a collaboration contract which uh, precise the way that the PhD will work in between the two institutions and um, the money transfer from the private company to the academic lab. There is a transfer of money to, um, I would say, to, to pay the knowledge that the academic lab will provide to the, to the institution. Uh, I think that's it. So <coughs> that's the this, uh, this is the organization. And the INRT and the SWIFT department is actually dealing with receiving all the projects, analyzing all the projects, validating all the projects, and at the end, say to the, to the company, okay, you are allowed to do that or you're not allowed to do that. Um, the, the success rate is uh, about 88%. So there is a high level of, of, uh, uh, of agreement between the, the company and the RNIT. Uh, one word about the reason why we should reject a project is mainly because of the subject, which is not as expected in terms of level of PhD research. It's too low. It's not a real research project. The second, why, the second reason why we should reject a project is that the PhD student is not good enough, in a way. 
he doesn't have the competencies or he's not uh, as good as good student as he should be. And the third is that the company is not strong enough to support the salary for three years and the way to manage this, the study research together with the PhD in a good way. Um, if you remember, the, the company will receive 14,000 euros per year, which does not cover the whole salaries. Salaries is more than 14,000 euros per year. So it's a good help, but it doesn't cover all the salaries. So we do need to check that, especially for small companies and the startups or very small companies, we need to make sure that they will be strong enough in terms of economic to support the project right to the end. We, it's just a, a hypothesis, but uh, we need to check that. <coughs> so, few data. Um, here, we just show the, the evolution of the number of uh, new projects um, allowed each year. So, if you see that in 2000, we, we were about uh, seven, 700 new projects a year, and it, it rises up since 14 years, and last year we were at about uh, um, 1,377 new projects, so very close to 1,400. And this year we already have covered the 1,400 new projects. So with the quota is already done for this year, because we had a, a high level of um, candidates this year compared to previous year. We do not have the analysis yet to understand why there are more candidate this year compared to the other years, but this is a fact that we do have this year much more candidate compared to previ previous years. So we are, we try to negotiate with the ministry to get more allowed uh, new projects for the coming years. Um, this is the distribution between the, 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 the curses of the candidates, where do they come from, and Roughly, there are 50% of candidates coming from academic masters and 50% coming from, uh, from um, engineering school. So that's more or less the distribution between both uh, courses. Here, this is the, um, the, distribution, the, yeah, the distribution about the different uh, academic uh, area. So you see that there is a non-homogeneous distribution, which is normal because nothing is really equal, but you see that we cover all the academic, um, academic domains. The big one is obviously the software technologies, engineering science, but I really want to, to insist on the fact that we do have, I'm sorry, uh, where is the point? Uh, no. ah, okay. If you look at those two one, this, um, this one, which is humanity and social science, 14% last year. And the other one, science of the society, which is 12%. So all together, this uh, science of society and science of humanity represents more than one fourth of the total allowed new project every year. And this is important to really understand that the CIF program is not only for industries. It's not only for, I would say, um, um, I don't like that, but pure science, like uh, mechanics, aeronautics, uh, um, uh, chemistry, industry, whatever. We do have 27% of new program specially allowed for science of humanity and science of, uh, of so, uh, social science. And this is really important to keep that in mind, that the CIF is not only, again, for um, pure science, but it's also for soft science, if I should say in a way. Uh, here, this is salaries. If you, if, you are, um, if you are accepted for this program, you do receive a salary, and there's a minimum salary that the company should give you. Uh, it's it's 23,484 euros per year, and this is um, um, including taxes. In France, there are including and without taxes. And, uh, and you see here the distribution of the exact salaries for last year, and you see that the, the minimum salary is only, I would say, allowed for 13% of the whole new project. Basically, the average salary is, is not 23, uh, about 24,000, but it's 29,000 euros. It gives you that, it just shows you that industries believe that this is a program that should get some, uh, some, um, some level and some recognitions. 
That's why the salary is much higher than the minimum salary which is uh, requested. And um, you see that most of the salary is in this area, which is in this one. And there is, of, of course, there are a few salaries, 9%, which are more than 35,000 euros per year, which is good salary in France, like, um, like a beginner's, uh, like an engineer beginner, beginner's engineer. Here, this is the, the, the um, distribution about the, um, the, um, the uh, sector of activities, and you see that we do cover almost all sectors of activities. We do not show the two, 277, uh, 257 uh, official uh, sectors of academics in France, but we, we just gather them, and you see that we cover all of them. I'm not going to go that much in details, but we do have a, a very good... Um, okay, just five minutes. So here, this is the, the distribution for the, 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 the five last years of the, the CIF taken by small companies, intermediate company, and very large company. What I want to show you here is that the number of new contracts uh, taken by big company are very similar to the number of contracts taken by small company. This is really interesting to see that if you look at all the small company, they are taking about the same number of new contracts versus the very large company. Now if you look at the number of companies behind, this is very different. The number of company showed that about 500 companies uh, taking at least one contract per year are for small companies. And the big companies, they are almost 100. Which means that, in average, a big, a big company can take like six new contracts every year. The top is one company in France having uh, 177 contracts ongoing. So there is a, a big uh, difference between different companies, of course. I'm going to do that very quickly. I don't have that much time. This is the behavior of the um, of the of the PhD after the three years long uh, contract. What are they doing? One third stay in the company, and seventy percent of those people have they stay in the company because they are they prepare their their uh, their uh, behavior their future. They really work on that in advance. It's not in the last three months that they decided to stay in the company or not. They really prepare their career in the company right in advance. <coughs> so international side of the of the CIF, here you, here you have the distribution according to the the nationalities and you see there is about three quarter from France but you do have almost all regions and if you look at uh, Europe, Europe is um, Europe outside of the UE is there actually. Europe European Union is, is, is right there. This is only, uh, only a few percentage because uh, there is many uh, other programs that can be allowed in, uh, in Europe. So. so another international side for, uh, for the CIF program is the fact that you can have, in addition to the academic lab, the French academic lab, you can have an academic lab in another country. And then you have a co tutel organization between the two labs, which allows the student to go in the other country for minimum one year and, uh, and uh, doing, um, I would say, complementary research in this uh, academic lab and making a connection between the two labs. And it does, it works. We do have co tutel we have like uh, 20, 25 co tutel per year, depending on the year, but it's about the number of co tutel we do have. This one is, um, is not for PhD student, this is for pre-PhD student, for master degree um, student. It is a fear doc. It's a pre-research program. This is done together with the N plus I uh, organization. Basically, and to go very quickly, is just uh, it's allowed to a master degree student to spend um, to spend five months in France, two months with courses explaining what is research in France, how does it work, what should be the skills expected from a, from a PhD student. And then there is three months uh, of um, internship, either in, a, in an academic lab or in an R&D department in a private uh, company. And this program is just at the beginning. We expect to get the first uh, 
ongoing program in uh, in uh, February next year and get the first internship by September ne next year. Today we have uh, about 20 uh, candidates and 15 have been validated. I think I'm almost at the end. Um, yeah, that's it. This is just to show you what there are. When you are a CIF student, there are many activities around just your research. You have uh, entrepreneurship challenges that you are part of. You have dedicated courses to understand the uh, intellectual properties. There are many activities around the PhD uh, if, you do ha if you are a PhD student. I think that's it. I need to make any conclusion. So I would be sitting here. If you have any questions, please um, just ask. Christian, it's your turn. Comme ça, c'est pas comme pas au genou, pas au menton, comme ça. Okay. Okay. So I hope you can hear me. Otherwise, just um, make a sign. So I'm Christiane. I was invited by uh, Berenice to present you a website that we have developed within uh, the French Research uh, Foundation, RFIEA. This website is called Funded. It's online now, like that. Okay, can't see me. It's online uh, under the address funded.fr, and uh, it lists and publishes funding opportunities for researchers in the social sciences and humanities. It's a website that's currently only um, addressing researchers in the social sciences and humanities. We do have um, funding opportunities for other disciplines as well, but our main target group are researchers in the social science and humanities because maybe they um, struggle the most to find funding opportunities. Um, this is how it looks like. I'm going to briefly talk you through the, the functions. Um, we are funded by partly by the French Ministry of Research, which is why our, our objective is um, at least double. One objective is to show um, which international funding opportunities exist, mobility and funding really like worldwide in France, in Europe and um, beyond Europe. And another objective is to make France more attractive as a research destination. So we're also trying to put a special spotlight on the opportunities existing within France. That's why we have these four categories, the first one being come to France, where we uh, list funding opportunities, fellowships and so on in France, like for foreign researchers coming, wanting to come to France. Um, we have a second category, go international, which is all the mobility programs outside of France, fellowships and so on. And we have these um, two categories at the bottom, which are funding programs for individual projects on the left and for collaborative projects, group projects and so on on the right. We have currently about 450 open calls listed on the website um, by a huge variety of institutions, which we are um, personally um, putting on the website. There's like a, a, an editorial officer behind this website, which is me. <laughs> Um, who puts the program on the website. There's like a, a, a control behind um, those programs. I can show you how it looks like on the inside. Oh, maybe just one thing. Um, we've also listed just for fun the sum that's currently available for funding for the social sciences and humanities. So on the 1st of December when I made this presentation, there's almost a billion euros available for um, social science and humanities funding, which is mean, which means if you apply to all those 450 calls and you had all those fellowships, you would get a, m a billion euros. So there is money available for even for the social sciences and humanities. On the inside, it looks like that. That's the category come to France. You've got all the calls for all the open calls for applications on these little cards. You can obviously filter them by different by different criteria. On the left, on the, on the upper left, you've got the filters by discipline, by institution type, and by topic, by, by research, by your research topic, like say you're working on migration, you can tick migration, then you're going to find the calls open for this field. Um, I 
yeah, that's the different calls. It's really like everything, like universities, foundation, government programs, um, all type of, 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 of um, mobility programs currently open. Uh, just going to scroll through them very quickly. Most of them are open to researchers from all nationalities and all countries. Some of them are bilateral agreements, like the ones on the, on the end, they are bilateral agreements between France and Romania, for example, or France and Belarus. But if that's the case, it's indicated in the title. So if nothing's indicated, then all of you are eligible to those programs. Um, the second category being Go International, programs outside of France. 218 calls open, which are also look the same like the other um, category. Um, this is the filter institution type. Just wanted to show how it looks like, which could be interesting if you're looking to go, for example, into a, an institute of advanced study or a museum or anything uh, like that. Um, and I can't remember. Ah, yeah, that's the filter topic. Um, quite, we tried to sort of identify the big research topics currently being funded. Um, and just to show you how it looks like, for example, say you're working on Africa, this is the little, the last column um, regions, you're working on Africa and African studies, you tick Africa, and you're going to find yourself with five open calls for African studies to work on Africa. You've got, um, yeah, that's how they look like, um, and you can, you've got on the upper left corner, under where it says five calls, just below, you've got a little ruler which says postdoc experience. This is to um, filter the calls um, in terms of eligibility of your postdoc experience. Say you have three years of postdoc experience, you defended your thesis three years ago, you put the little ruler on three or on four, I think I made it. Um, and then you're only going to find the calls, the programs that you are um, eligible for with your um, junior research experience. You can also um, see the expired calls. You've got this button there on the upper right corner, this one. Um, and if you do that, you're going to find the expired calls that are not currently open. Why is that important? Why do you need to know what you have missed? Normally, all the programs we list on funded are recurrent. That means they're going to open again eventually later in the year. And you can bookmark them by clicking on the little blue, um, blue flag there with the star. You can bookmark them and then receive an automatic email alert when they open again, when they're being published again on funded. So you don't need to come back on the website every time. You can just bookmark the programs you find specially interesting and then um, and then receive the, the emails automatically. This is how it looks like um, the page of a call, like the call for African studies in Cambridge. You've got all the information, all the technical information on the right-hand column, the duration of the fellowship, the, uh, the, the, the amount of the grant, the number of grants, uh, and so on. You've got, um, you can bookmark it, as you see, add to bookmarks uh, the little blue flag. You've got the institutions linked to this program uh, in grey, also on the, on the right-hand column. And you can, oh, that's the bookmark function. Da, da, da. And you can also um, bookmark an institution, like in that case, the University of Cambridge, by clicking on the blue flag, and then you'll be alerted automatically by email when there's a new call for this institution um, opening. Um, there's a third way of staying up to date on the programs that you're interested in, which is that you can save your search. Like, for example, that's the search I just made for um, African studies. And you've got below the filters on the left, you've got a little golden button saying save your search. And you can uh, then save your search with those criteria, like your discipline, your institution, your topic whatsoever. And then be automatically alerted by email when there's a new call opening for this, um, for this criteria. That's your user account. You don't need to be connected. Everything is open freely. All the calls are open freely and the whole website is free. It's only if you want to use the bookmark function that we ask you to uh, create your user account and connect yourself. And then you can find your bookmarks and your safe searches in your user account. To finish, um, I'm going to briefly talk you through the funding programs. So that's the two lower parts of the 
home page so the first one individual research funding mostly thematic also a huge variety of, of options in France and abroad of course foundations universities and so on that's where you're going to find also the for example the European Research Council programs which are obviously individual funding programs you can scro scroll through them by voila and the fourth section, collaborative research funding, which is everything that includes the, um, the construction of a consortium or a research team. Um, it's in this section that you're going to find the H2020 um, research calls. For those of you who are familiar with that, I don't have time to explain that program, which is quite complicated. But we, just to say that we also have all the H2020 programs calls um, for SSH researchers on the website with filters, with strategic information, with contact information um, and so on. So it's quite a good way also to stay up to date on what happens in H2020. Um, we also have a blog, that's how it looks like, with different kinds of information in French and in English. Oh, the whole website is French and English actually, it's bilingual, I forgot to say that. Um, and the blog is also sort of bilingual French and English. We are on Facebook and on Twitter, so d feel free to follow us on uh, social media. And that's our team, so we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mariana and I work uh, for the Royal Society. I'm the senior manager of the UK grants portfolio. And today I guess I have the difficult role to convince you to come uh, to do your research in UK. Uh, so I'm gonna take you uh, through um, a few uh, funding opportunities for early career scientists. First of all, What is the Royal Society? Founded in 6060, the Royal Society is the oldest continuously operating Academy of Science in Europe. Uh, it is also a self-governing fellowship supported um, by a number of fellows and we do elect uh, 50 fellows every year as well as uh, foreign members. And the fellows are very much the backbone of our organization. Um, many I'm sure not many of you know that we also have a quite inspirational motto um, here featured in this beautiful um, uh, window, which is uh, Nullius in Verba. And it can be translated as take nobody words for it. And um, reflects the determination of fellows to verify statements through facts. And sums up also our, our aims, such as recognizing and support uh, science and excellence uh, in science, um, as well as encouraging uh, development in science for the benefit of the humanity. Um, recently, the society has refreshed uh, its strategic priorities um, in order to reflect uh, changing developments in the society and in, uh, in culture and in politics including, of course, the recent uh, UK's uh, decision of leaving the, e the EU. Um, our first priority oops, is, of course, promoting excellence in science. Um, the aim of the society is to recognize outstanding scientists, no matter who they are or where they come from. Uh, this is, for example, one of our fellow, Professor Snaith, and he recently was awarded one of our prestigious medal, the Kavli Medal, for his discovery um, of new solar cells that will improve um, the efficiency of solar energy. Our second priority is, of course, supporting international scientific collaboration, uh, as well as um, giving our, uh, our current fellows the opportunity to access international funding and international uh, facilities. Uh, and finally, um, demonstrating the importance of science to everyone, um, because, of course, science uh, is influenced by society and culture, 
um, as well as scientific discoveries change people's lives, um, it is important that the society keeps engaging with different groups within the society in order, obviously, to maximize uh, its impact. So one of our major activities is, of course, providing, providing uh, support to outstanding scientists. We have a wide range uh, of grants, uh, but today I will only focus on our um, opportunities for early career scientists at postdoctoral level. These fellowships are aimed to provide um, researchers with the security um, as well as um, ability to pursue their um, research passion. Uh, we have uh, three different types of fellowships. The um, University Research Fellowship, this is our flagship scheme. Uh, it has been um, running for 35 years and it covers the areas of natural sciences, uh, physical sciences, um, um, including engineering. Um, we also run this scheme in partnership with Science Foundation Ireland in order to support um, researchers who um, want to conduct um, research in, uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, for um, those scientists who are working in the area of uh, biomedical sciences, um, we run the um, Seren Riedale Fellowship uh, in partnership with the Wellcome Trust. This is another very prestigious um, fellowship. And least but not last, named after the only uh, female British scientist who has ever won a Nobel Prize, the Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship. Uh, this is another opportunity for junior scientists with the potential to become leader in their field and, um, and who have the needs for flexibility. So it has a, like a different um, aspect. And this is uh, Michelle Mora. Uh, she's one of our university research fellows. She's a material scientist working at Imperial College. I really like this quote from Michelle because it really uh, encapsulates the um, ethos of our, um, of our early career portfolio. And in fact, she says that her fellowship has given her the freedom to develop a substantial research program as well as security to build long-term research plans. And this is really what you want when you have to develop your, your career. So let's have a look, first of all, at who can apply. Um, for the, so the, research, the University Research Fellowships is open to um, postdocs with um, research experience between, um, that spans between two, three to eight years. Um, these are five years of flexible funding with the opportunity to apply for three-year renewal. So that means that our fellows have for eight years the opportunity to focus on their research without taking up any additional admin or uh, teaching duties. So they are completely relieved from those. Um, and that's a caveat for all our fellows. Um, we only have one round uh, per year and usually opens around July. So it will be July 2018. So the same is for the Serenry Dale Fellowship. Actually, that's not true anymore. So the Serenry Dale Fellowship is open to anyone, um, regardless on the year of um, uh, on the postdoc experience, uh, as long as they can demonstrate that they are already conducting uh, their research independently. Um, the uh, Serum Redale has a preliminary application stage and the next one will be in April. Um, while the Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship is open to postdocs with a research experience up to six years and um, they need to demonstrate uh, their need for flexibility at the time of the application. However, um, the selection process is based on the candidate, of, on candidates' merit and the um, quality of science. And next round will open um, late in 2018, around October. October. Um, all our um, schemes can be held flexibly. Oh, and of course, we don't have nationality restrictions, obviously. So all our schemes can be held uh, flexibly in order to meet um, the, your personal circumstances. So we do provide the opportunity of taking um, maternity leave, 
paternity leave, shared parental leave, and up to one year sabbatical. And this is actually one opportunity that many of our fellows have already taken in order just to um, start new collaborations that might have also led to a new jobs somewhere else. And Toby, for example, he took um, six months of shared parental leave in order to support his partner uh, raising their, uh, their first child. And in this case, obviously, his fellowship has been uh, extended in order to recover any uh, research time lost. Um, we also uh, give um, to our newly appointed research fellows the opportunity to apply um, for a starter research grant in order to obviously increase um, your uh, research group. Um, uh, they can apply for funding for research-related cost and a PhD studentship up to a total value of 150,000 pounds or 176,000 euros for four years. Um, we have also been recently recognized as uh, a competent body uh, able to endorse application for tier one visas. Of course, this does not apply to European um, scientists, but it does apply to um, the many, um, all, all the scientists coming from overseas. Um, and many of them have already um, taken this opportunity. And in this case, the visa application is accelerated because uh, demonstrating that you have already um, been awarded a fellowship from the Royal Society is already a hallmark of uh, extreme talent. So the visa application will, will be quite um, straightforward. And we do liaise with the Home Office. And if you need more information, please contact um, or check the website from the Home Office. Um, just an example of one of the scientists who applied for a tier one visa, Nobel Prize, James Rothman. Um, uh, he um, applied um, uh, at the time where he um, started his collaboration with the Institute of Neurology at University College London. Um, I just have like a couple of few um, slides, um, um, which I think they, they might be like interesting. Um, these are just about uh, the application process uh, to our schemes, um, as well as some hints and tips about what do we look for in our candidates, um, and, um, and, and, what does, and what, what are the ingredients for a successful um, application. I'm not going into the detail of the process. I just wanted to let you know that all our fellowship um, process have two stages of um, shortlisting. So one is a panel assessment, second one is an independent review stage, and then we have a final uh, interview stage. And I'll give you more information in a minute. So what are the ingredients for a successful application? So the main ingredient is you. The Royal Society funds the scientists and not the science, um, and this is because our aim is to encourage and support scientists who have the potential to become leaders in their field. Therefore, what we look for is the excellent scientific merit, track record, innovation, and creativity. Of course, your project has to be suitable, has to be well-structured, um, and the quality of science has to be high. And we also um, look for um, if you have thought about what role the fellowship can have in your career development and obviously the suitability of the host institution. Uh, that's finally all, all our fellowships comes with scheme notes. So if you need to know more about any of our fellowships, just read our um, guidance notes. They have all the information about eligibility and how to write an application. And it is very important to write a good like, summary. I know that obviously that's probably, you already know about that. So many fellowship applications, uh, they, um, they recruit um, uh, panel members who obviously are expert in their fields, but they may not be expert in your particular niche. So obviously you have to make sure that your lay summary can be understood by a non-expert audience. So we usually advise to ask your friends to give you feedback about your lay summary. Be enthusiastic, just make sure that you highlight why we should fund you. And obviously leave plenty of time for troubleshooting. And of course, if you want, you can contact us. We are a really uh, friendly bunch of people and we will be able and really be happy to um, reply to you or just have a chat um, over the phone. Finally, just a few information about the interview stage. Obviously, the in interviews are always very scary. 
that's not nothing, nothing to say. That's nothing new about that. However, um, this will be your probably your only opportunity to have 15 member eminent uh, scientists who have been gathered only for you and who are going to be very interested in listening to your science and to what you have to say. And that doesn't happen very often. So just take this opportunity as your chance to shine and to really to get your, to get your, your science across. Um, each interview is led by two main assessors, but also, but of course, other panel members, they can ask questions as well. The questions are focused on the science of the application, uh, the choice of the host institution, that's really important, and whether you have thought about the, um, uh, the role, again, of your, uh, that the fellowship might play in uh, developing your career. Because we want, obviously, our fellows to become independent and hopefully to, ha to have a permanent job. And finally, you are going to be successful, I'm sure, if you obviously have listened to my talk and if you just go through the application. You're going to be happy as this kid. Um, these are just few, just few um, information that I've collected um, doing like different university visits. And these are like questions that we, relate, that we usually get asked um, by um, postdocs. Um, we don't publish the success rate, and that's because it may vary from one scheme to another, and it, it does vary from one year to another. So the bottom line is don't be put off by the statistic and just apply. We are very obviously dedicated to um, uh, diversity and to uh, address the issues that um, uh, many individuals might have due to different barriers. Um, and we also provide feedback um, upon request, and we don't have, um, and you can reapply as as, many, as long as you obviously fit the uh, eligibility criteria, you can apply as many times as you want. Finally, why should you apply for the Royal Society? Um, so even though we are a small organization, um, no, we are a very prestigious one. And once you are a research fellow from the Royal Society, this is something that will stay with you on your CV, on your university profile forever. Uh, showing the high quality of your science. Um, we are also very flexible, so all our schemes are very flexible, but the flexibility is not just related to personal circumstances, it's also flexibility related to your project. As we understand that science changes continuously, we do give you the chance to change um, your um, scientific questions um, during, during your fellowship. And finally, once you, are, uh, once you become a research fellow from the Royal Society, you also gain access to uh, many other opportunities. Um, for example, we have uh, communication and media training um, courses, leadership courses, how to, uh, to write a successful grant application, mentoring scheme, so you can be, uh, if you want, you can be paired with a fellow of the Royal Society who can provide you with advice. And this is my last slide. Just want to leave you with another quote from one of our fellow, Stephen Spell. Um, and hopefully, uh, like, and I hope that some of you will apply so that you will be able to pursue your independent blue skies research, uh, as well as connecting with a network of world-class scientists. Thank you very much. <laughs>good afternoon uh, first I would like to apologize for late arrival but uh, I was asked for attending a last minute meeting at the minister and uh, when the minister says uh, come you have to come uh, so I'm Isabel Schuster I'm um, the director of uh, the Inno Energy PhD school Inno Energy is an European tool to um, to uh, increase the, um, the um, competitivity um, of Europe 
and the idea is to make people from research, industry, and higher education work together to boost innovation in Europe in the field of sustainable energy. Of course, the uh, European aspect of this tool is very important. Uh, so I would like first to give you some words about what is Inno Energy, because I'm sure you, you never heard about, about it. Um, we, I will give you uh, some additional information about the training courses, of course, about the uh, international European connections, and I will present you some, uh, some guidelines in order to join the, the program. So, uh, in 2010, uh, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, who, uh, who, that is uh, uh, an European body uh, directly funded by the European Commission, um, would like to invent new tools in order to boost innovation in some strategic fields. And uh, some KICS knowledge and innovation communi communities have been launched uh, late 2010, seven years ago. Uh, in order to address some societal challenges or very uh, huge uh, challenge for, uh, for Europe and mainly uh, the one of these uh, challenges is the uh, energetic transition and the sustainable, sustainable energetic future for Europe. So uh, our mission is to boost innovation in this field and we do that uh, in, uh, with the three kinds of activities, some education activities, some uh, activities um, connected to uh, technology transfer through innovation project, and we try also to support uh, new business uh, activities, new startups. And we are convinced that making uh, all people in these three uh, activities work together would be the key of success. And the second conviction is that uh, PhD candidates are very key person for that, because of course, naturally, they, they uh, combine um, research and um, high education first, uh, but they are very key people in order to join industry uh, commitment, industry concern, and in order to put some new uh, products and new services uh, on the market in order to give the opportunity to everybody everywhere to, uh, to um, use uh, better of energy. So uh, the program in Energy PhD School uh, is aiming to transform research into innovation. You know research focuses more about uh, papers and patents, and innovation on the other side more focused on prototypes and products. And there is a gap between both, not only in France, but also in Europe. And uh, our objective is to bridge this gap. So we try to reach this gap, to, uh, to put good ideas and to transform them in, into products on the market. And we would like to give some PhD candidates uh, eager to do so an entrepreneurial approach. So uh, for that, we, have, um, we propose a, um, a program. It, uh, the program is an additional program, uh, additional education to innovation additional to the trainings of research uh, received in uh, the university or uh, research organization, uh, who are our uh, partners. We have now in the program 40 partners in uh, 10 uh, countries. And uh, we, we, uh, with the program, we try to elaborate and to connect people in research with the commercial sector. So, how we do it, more concretely? First, we offer um, uh, courses, uh, workshop, uh, and other summer school uh, training, a focus on entrepreneurship, innovation, and business. But these courses are very designed for PhD candidates because we, uh, it is not possible to, to talk about business with PhD candidates in engineering science or physical science in the same way than uh, students in a business school. So these courses are very uh, designed for uh, PhD candidates. Of course, we try to uh, create and we give the opportunity to create international connections, not only research connections, but also industrial connections. Uh, there is a very dynamic network, the PhD candidates community itself, but also all the, uh, the, the ecosystem, you know, energy ecosystem, the ecosystem of Inno Energy gives us now more than 300 partners, two third uh, companies and one third uh, universities or uh, research organizations. And our main, main uh, 
objective is to give the, uh, to the PhD candidates in the program the opportunity to open their vision of the field of sustainable energy. So maybe more uh, deeply, the, uh, the training offer, uh, so uh, it's additional layer to research and what is successful is a combination of both. The idea is to give the opportunity to, uh, to give impact to the, your research uh, with a flexible timing. That means that you have courses uh, all the year uh, round, and so you can choose some uh, courses, but in a uh, in white uh, articulation with your agenda. Uh, the universities that uh, deliver uh, the courses are very high ranked universities in Europe. And uh, you have also special uh, meetings and workshops in order to develop your personal skills, uh, especially entrepreneurship skills, innovation, and business. For example, some, uh, some courses they are already uh, they are, um, they are often uh, evolving because we try to be uh, at, the, at the front of, of the field in, in each year. So, for example, uh, a first course is about energy economics. Uh, some another uh, summer school in Barcelona uh, about entrepreneurship. Uh, we have another um, boot camp about innovation. Another about law for academic innovators. So really designed for uh, PhD candidates. And they, the, the courses are uh, given in different cities in Europe. It's also a way to increase um, the the network. Uh, all the uh, elective courses, uh, more focus on, um, on uh, soft skills, communication, leadership, and so on, but also some technical, more technical course, but with the uh, uh, very transdisciplinary approach, and uh, also what is very important for us, to, uh, to learn by doing. So all courses, if possible and if relevant, are focused on solving a real problem in order to learn how to handle complex uh, topics, how to, co to connect with, uh, with business, uh, how to, uh, to uh, consider, the, uh, for example, the IP strategy and so on. International connections. So uh, in the program, in order to, uh, to award the final uh, certificate, uh, you have to realize uh, an international placement, uh, mobility, in another uh, country than the, your home country. Uh, from the minimum is four months, maximum uh, 12 months. Um, it, uh, the, um, the mobility must be um, an, an opportunity to increase uh, the impact of your research or your, um, your uh, innovation project or your business project, uh, at least your personal and professional uh, project. And we support, in this case, uh, travel, accommodation and subsistence during your uh, mobility. And of course, we thanks to, to our, uh, to our um, um, network, we can help you to find the right uh, partner for the mobility um, and the right partner for the, at the right moment. It's also very important. So we organize some uh, conferences and events, again, to increase the opportunity to connect with people, with researchers, with industries, with uh, uh, leaders, with uh, uh, regional authorities, uh, with startups, and so on. So you have uh, uh, all PhD candidates have um, a, a small amount of money they can ask for, uh, but they have to convince us that it's very important, uh, even for us, to to fund this uh, uh, exploration, personal exploration. So it could be a visit, uh, it could be a prototyping, it could be an exhibition, it could be a conference, whatever. But we have to to be convinced. It's very important to bridge research uh, towards innovation. We organize also an annual conference, uh, three-day events with many, uh, many activities, many different people, uh, in order to learn, explore, inspire, connect, and develop. Um, so I will already mention this uh, individual uh, exploration, so the individual program. It's something more uh, tailored to, you, to, your, uh, to your need. So again, uh, in joining the PhD school program, uh, you will benefit from the power of the network. So now, 
uh, 300 uh, partners in, uh, in our energy and especially 40 in, uh, in the PhD school program. Maybe something more practical, uh, what is the, the funding scheme? Uh, so uh, we found the, the, the funding, the, the, the cost of the courses and the tuition fees is uh, directly funded by Uno Energy, but uh, for each um, PhD candidate attending the course, um, there is, or the conference, there is different maximum for the mobility, travel and uh, living uh, expenses. Um, there is also uh, so a maximum funding for the personal e uh, exploration and for the mobility, which is the main topic today. So it's uh, comfortable, and we, we think so, and it's very useful in order to focus uh, on the project during your placement and not on money. So how to join the, the program? Um, for the PhD candidates, the benefit is uh, very high. The firstly, the opportunity to enrich your innovation capacity, so to come from research towards innovation or to push your, the, research, the results from your research towards people of innovation and to bridge this uh, days valley between uh, research and uh, innovation. Of course, uh, you will uh, enrich your also your CV uh, with uh, specific uh, skills, it is possible to, you have uh, at the end a good idea of which com uh, competencies you can offer to, uh, to an employer. Uh, we are working with ABG for that also, for, evaluate your, for evaluating your, your skills. Uh, the network, very important, the other PG candidates that will become also researchers, leaders, uh, people in the industry uh, and so on. A better understanding of business, how to give impact to your an economical and societal impact with your research, uh, knowledge, yes, of course, and again, uh, impact. So uh, we are looking uh, for candidates who are very interested first in sustainable energy. So we have some uh, different uh, topics about energy. Um, um, of course, uh, the candidates we, we are looking for uh, want uh, really to, to solve global energy challenges, so it's very important to, uh, to, um, to appropriate the, at least the European uh, scale and the, the worldwide scale. And uh, also um, the, 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 the researchers, the young researchers we, we are looking for, uh, must also um, uh, have in mind a uh, business or an application potential for your research. So uh, they, they would like, to, they, they, they must have some uh, links, even informal, with, uh, with the industry. So support to supervisors is very important. The, the, the only one eligible condition is to be enrolled in an uh, European institution, to have two years before BHD events, to be, to be comfortable with the program to have funding for the research and uh, the agreement of the supervisor to attend the courses, event, and the mobility. So uh, the application is online all the year, um, all the year around, and uh, we, we have three assessment centers per year, and the next one is the 4th of March, and we try to, to be very uh, rapid with our answer, and uh, maximum four weeks after your application, you have the answer and the final decision. <laughs> and we have a, a table with some uh, brochure in the, in the corridor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Joel Hudefeld from the Fund for Scientific Research, uh, FNRS. Uh, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Florence Quist, uh, we both work for the European and International Affairs Unit, and uh, we'll present uh, something uh, of the FNRS uh, uh, here tonight. So let's see if it works. Yes. 
and uh, more specifically will present the, the opportunities for PhD and postdocs uh, fellowships at the FNRS. Um, so, uh, before going into the heart of the matter, uh, there's not only uh, uh, excellence in, uh, in, in Belgium, but there's also good living. So, I mean, you are in the heart of Europe. Uh, this is, uh, you can also, I mean, uh, great food, drinks, there's also lots of culture, lots of history. So, there are also other reasons to come to Belgium uh, besides the excellent science. Um, then, uh, this is Belgium. Belgium is a very small country, but it's also uh, a very interesting uh, uh, way in which the, the, the society is organized. So Belgium has three communities and three regions, and uh, the, the funding of research uh, is, uh, is uh, managed accordingly. So within the three communities, this is where basic research uh, is financed, and within the regions, this is where uh, applied science uh, is, uh, is financed. So the Fund for Scientific Research, FNRS, it's uh, firmly based in the French-speaking community of Belgium, the French-speaking community meaning Wallonia and Brussels. And so we fund basic research uh, in the six universities of the French-speaking community. So uh, l'Université catholique de Louvain in, uh, in Louvain-la-Neuve, uh, l'ULB, l'Université libre de Bruxelles in Brussels, of course, uh, l'Université de Liège, uh, these are the three complete universities, so, so full universities, and you have three uh, somewhat smaller universities, l'Université de Namur, uh, l'Université de Mons, which is, uh, specializes in materials uh, uh, very much, and, and uh, finally l'Université Saint-Louis de Bruxelles, which is a university that specializes in social and human sciences. So, a bit more uh, about the FNRS uh, as a fund. So we are a research uh, funding agency. Uh, we have uh, our annual budget was, I mean, this is already a somewhat old figure because it dates back to 2016. In 2017, it will be more closer to 200 million euros, of which 90% is public funding. And so we have several funding instruments uh, for fellowships, for grants, for international cooperation and mobility. But for this presentation, I'll go into those for the fellowships, which are, which are the most interesting for you. So uh, the FNRS, funding researchers, is what we do. So we uh, fund approximately 2,300 scientists at any given time, and we fund researchers on all levels from the PhD until the tenure track. So we really, you can have a full research career within uh, the, uh, the FNRS. So and you can see the division a bit between uh, the number of PhD students, then the number of postdocs and uh, the, tenure, the tenure track fellows. So tenure track, there's three different levels. You have the research associates. Um, then uh, afterwards you have uh, what we call uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the research associate, research director, and, and, and uh, the highest level, no, no that's uh, the maître de recherche, as we say in French, and then the highest level is uh, the, the, the research director. So there's two calls. It's very straightforward uh, at the FNRS. There is a call in the fall, which will open very soon. This is our call for mandates. So this is the, the primary call uh, for you to focus on. And we also have a call uh, for research projects, which is uh, at the, uh, in late spring. So we work, we are a research funding agency. Uh, we work with uh, an evaluation procedure, which I will explain a bit more in detail. Uh, uh, we have a database of about 10,000 external experts uh, that we consult for reviews. Uh, we get about 4,500 proposals per year, uh, and uh, these are being judged by 14 scientific panels. So, uh, mobility opportunities. As I already said, for the fellowships, uh, on the PhD level, we have several. We have our standard fellowship, which is called Aspirant in, uh, in, in, in French. Uh, then we have uh, Fria as well. Fria is a more uh, uh, it's a strategic uh, a science. So, this is more uh, towards uh, basic science 
uh, towards strategic science. There's also some industry involved there, and fresh and fresh is uh, uh, on the social and human sciences. Uh, so then, on the postdoc level, as I already said, there you have them. Uh, so Chargé de Recherche, which is the standard postdoc, uh, uh, so to speak, and then afterwards the tenure track, which starts with uh, Chercheur Qualifié. And you need to, so to get further in the track, you need to start as a Chercheur Qualifié to move on in the career afterwards. Um, then for the grants, I will not really go into that because it's a bit more difficult, but our main instrument, uh, instrument is that, that for research projects you call PDR. So then other instruments for mobility, uh, this is really uh, once you have a position uh, for the FNRS, once you have a research position in French-speaking Belgium, you can uh, uh, apply for uh, short-time mobility, going to congresses, etc. Uh, and also, uh, the Chargé de Recherche has the possibility to, uh, it's a three-year postdoc, but you can suspend it for three years, you have to do it within six years to uh, be able to do mobility uh, outside of Belgium afterwards. Then, uh, uh, finally, uh, the PIN Bilat M is a, is a small instrument that I will not go into it. Um, this is uh, the, you see the average ages uh, where, uh, where of the candidates that are applying. So you can see aspirant, this is uh, the, yeah, the standard age more or less to apply for uh, a PhD. And you see it going up uh, within uh, the research career. Um, as I already said, so the call for fellowships, it'll open very soon. So uh, these are three different calls, so aspirant, chargé de recherche, and uh, chercheur qualifié. And the call for grants, uh, in which in those grants, uh, the, the, the principal investigator can, uh, ap can apply for personnel. So, and he, within his project, he can, uh, he can apply for PhD students, postdocs, and also the mobility postdoc, which is a, uh, a special postdoc position which is paid by a grant, in fact, and not by a salary, uh, and also for consumables and equipment. So, um, as I already told you, uh, within the procedure, there's uh, 14 different panels. Uh, here you can see them uh, by, uh, uh, by topic. So, uh, they are over the three main domains. Uh, so, five uh, within social sciences and humanities, uh, four uh, in the medical and life sciences, and four as well in exact and natural sciences. And there's one special panel uh, which is more uh, related to, uh, to development. And uh, this is for the procedure. So this, in this case, for the aspirant, the PhD, it's a one-step procedure, meaning that uh, you apply, as you can see, through uh, our instrument, uh, our uh, submission platform, Semaphore. Then uh, the, our scientific officers, they, uh, they appoint uh, external reviewers. These external reviewers grade uh, the proposals and then afterwards it is discussed within a scientific panel who comes up with the final ranking list after which our uh, board of trustees ta uh, takes the final funding decision based on the ranking list. For uh, the fellowships and grants it's a it's more or less the same but there is uh, an extra step uh, because uh, there are the criteria are somewhat different because you have a criteria for the PI, so the applicant, for the project and the proposed research environment, but otherwise uh, the, the procedure uh, is similar. So, and then uh, it also goes uh, to the remote evaluation report uh, is taken by the members of the committee. They uh, appoint a rapporteur and a co-rapporteur who give a final grade, which is then discussed in the scientific panel. Voilà. And now I hand over to my uh, colleague Florence, who will uh, give you more details on the internationalization. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a few uh, numbers of facts and figures on our calls. Um, we try to maintain a success rate of what we call an acceptable success rate. So we try not to go lower than 18% or 15%. It's, it's roughly in the range of 15 to uh, 20%. 
Uh, as you can see, for a mandate, uh, we get a lot of applications in uh, social sciences because this is where more personnel uh, is uh, often needed. Uh, but we also have a strong representation of, um, of uh, pure sciences, so science and um, natural sciences. Uh, our calls are very open. So we are open to all nationalities. We have no uh, preference. Uh, and just to give you uh, the uh, international feeling of our call, we have about 62 nationalities uh, who apply each year, roughly. 48% uh, of uh, the applicants to our postdoc positions uh, have gotten their PhD in another country. So these are very open calls. And we've seen since uh, 2011 a, a steep increase uh, of our internationalization because, as you can see, uh, more than 60% of applications came from um, people from with an international background. So either getting their PhD in another country or their master's in another country. The most represented countries, uh, you will not be surprised that France is, uh, for the French community, <laughs> is a very high in the uh, in our uh, representation. We also have a strong representation of Italy, Spain, Germany, and other countries as well. In terms of collaboration, uh, the FNRS, uh, this is the number of publications, that co-publications that we have with other countries. Uh, we, we do this analysis to know who our strongest uh, collaborators are. Again, not surprisingly, France comes up first because it's our neighbor. Uh, but we also have good collaborations with the United States, the United Kingdom as well, and uh, other countries. So there you go. You have all our contact information here. If you have any questions about our grants, uh, my colleague and I will be more than happy to help you out. And uh, if you have questions now, we can also help out. Hello everyone, so I'm uh, Jennifer Clark, I'm from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of Europe and Foreign Affairs. Um, I look after university and scientific partnerships um, at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, looking after the, the zone Europe, Asia and North America. So we split the world in two with a colleague who looks after the other half. Um, so, very briefly, um, what we do um, is I look after what we call scientific diplomacy, which is part of our diplomacy of influence. Um, and for that, we have a network in the embassies throughout the world. We have many attaches, some of whom you have seen yesterday and today, earlier today. Uh, we have attaches in our embassies for scientific and academic cooperation. Uh, so we, our scientific diplomacy has five main objectives. Of course, increase the contribution of French research to global research, uh, strengthen, um, in fact, work together with scientists throughout the world to address global challenges, such as an example which is very topical today, climate change. You may know that not too far away on the other side of the river, over there uh, is going on the big One Planet Summit with many heads of states at the moment on climate change. Um, we also work on research for development. We want to boost the mobility of researchers. This is extremely important. Uh, foreign researchers coming to France, French researchers going abroad, and of course, faster innovation. So. Uh, for PhDs, uh, what we have is you may know that many of our French embassies abroad have scholarships available uh, for PhDs, uh, which can be stu study scholarships, training grants, or high-level science scholarships, which are more for postdoc or, uh, or even afterwards for a short stay in France. So just to give you one example, for example, in the Czech Republic, they have what we call co um scholarships which are for doctoral programs between, in this case, one French and one Czech institution. So PhD students receive a scholarship uh, five months per year. Um, so this program 
can can work or well, will soon work in both directions in fact from from France to Czech Republic, from Czech Republic to France, and also we have internship for smaller stays. So this is something we have in many countries in Europe. Uh, so if you're interested in specific country, the best is to contact the attaché in that, in that country. So an ex other example is in Portugal, for example. Um, there we have a, a program, uh, again, Cotutel, which used to be called a strange name, uh, P-A-U-I-L-F, and now will be renamed Cotutel Pessoa uh, from January 2018, which again will fund Cotutel PhDs in both directions, France, Portugal, Portugal, France. So, I mean, depending on which countries you're interested in, uh, you can get in touch with our embassy. Then, open to all countries, we have the EFL program. The EFL program uh, we coordinate directly uh, centrally in, uh, in Paris. Um, we ask uh, our agency, uh, Campus France, to manage it. So it funds 10 months of mobility for a PhD as part of a joint supervision or a joint direction of thesis. Oh, pardon. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so... Voila, 10 months mobility um, is funded in this case with a monthly allowance for, for, the, for the PhD uh, student as well as some various expenses covered. So that's, that's the EFL program. If you just Google EFL, EFL Excellence Program, you'll get all the details. Um, then again, some, some of our embassies have specific calls for some doctoral program. So again, if you're interested in a specific cooperation with a country, it's worth getting in touch with the attaché. For example, uh, Italy, because our, our um, attaches, attaché from Italy couldn't come to meet you these two days. Uh, so I'll give you an example from there. So they have a call for PhD students to fund the organization of French-Italian study days. Um, so cooperative days where uh, young PhD students from France and Italy can get together and talk about a common topic together, uh, which is quite a nice novel idea. So if I go more to postdoctoral programs, I wanted to tell you about the Prestige program, which you may have heard of, which supports the international mobility of postdoctoral researchers to and from France. So the aim is to strengthen and broaden various uh, mobility initiatives because it's a co-funding initiative, so it, it funds one-third of the amount. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a European tool, so it's to strengthen the European research area. For France, it's managed by Campus France, again, our, our agency, our operator, and it's co-funded to the amount of 6 million euros via the, the Marie Curie actions. Uh, so to give you a bit more detail, uh, you have the website here, it's uh, prestige-postdoc.fr. So uh, it's uh, co-fund with all the French universities and research uh, organizations. It covers all fields of science. Uh, the call is open all year long with four cut-off, four deadlines. Um, and it can be either for incoming for one or two years in coming to France, outgoing from France for six months or 12 months, or for reintegration. Okay, and then finally, I wanted to tell you about our research mobility programs because that also concerns young researchers. So we have, um, with 60, more than 60 countries in the world, we have the, uh, what we call Uber Curien partnerships, Partenariat Uber Curien, or PHC, PHC. Uh, so these, these are research mobility programs um, which fund the cost of researchers that are moving, that are traveling between the two countries to establish linkages. Um, so it doesn't fund research as such. It's not a, it's not a high level research grant. This is just to fund the mobility. So the labs in both, on both sides should already have funding, national funding. And this is just a top up to allow both the senior researchers and the young researchers in the lab. And it's actually an evaluation criteria that the young researchers can travel in these grants. Um, so it allows them to travel and go to the partner lab to learn a new technique, to work with their partners, to uh, have some discussions, to strengthen the collaboration. Um, so we have, um, as I said, these programs with more than 60 countries, 
Some of them, the oldest is with Germany, it's more than 30 years old. Um, all of these programs are co-funded with the partner country. And as I said, the goal is to support new scientific partnerships and to have active participation by PhD students and postdocs in, in the teams. As I said, they have to take part in the mobility. The goal on the long term of these partnerships is again to help form new collaborations towards helping create more of a European research area and to help participate to European projects. So just to give you an idea of the 27 such programs we have in the European region, the large European region at the moment, more are being created, in fact, for next year with the UK, with Finland uh, and with some other countries. So there's constantly new programs. Um, so that's, that's very briefly, I can tell you more about, uh, about these programs. I didn't actually put the website, um, but again, if you Google uh, Hubert Curien partnerships, you will find the, the, the web page, uh, Campus France, again on the Campus France uh, operator web page, they have a page dedicated to these programs listing all the countries. Um, but if you're also interested in a spe specific country, you can also directly contact the attaché in that embassy who will tell you all the details of that specific program, or you can contact me to get further information. Um, and then just a, a final note on the program, which again is quite um, topical because our president uh, announced lots of researchers coming to France yesterday evening with our program Make Our Planet Great Again. Uh, so this was our president in June who launched an appeal to researchers, students, so researchers, young researchers, students, but also companies and NGOs, etc., to come to work in France on climate change issues. Um, you may have seen in, in the news, so yesterday evening, the first 18 researchers who have uh, been selected and funded to come to France on the long term were announced by the president yesterday, and they met the president yesterday evening um, at an event, including three, well, and three young researchers. There was one PhD student and two postdocs, uh, two postdocs who were there who will come to France through this uh, Make Our Planet Great Again program. So you have the website there. There will be, beginning of January, or beginning of 2018, sorry, there will be new programs launched, so new doctoral, postdoctoral, and mobility programs launched in line with Make Our Planet Great Again. Of course, this is limited to fields that have something to do with uh, energy, climate change, uh, sustainable development, etc. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Any questions for the speakers? So we'll ask one, uh, for at least for, for the people who are managing funding schemes. Can you give the participants one single advice to, um, to be successful in their grant application? Do you have some practical advice to give? I would say something very general. Uh, please uh, think about who will assess you first. And uh, if you have in mind, if you uh, know uh, enough things about who will assess you, you will find the right way to convince the committee, the organization, the funders to, uh, to fund you. So the, the key point is to, to know who you are addressing. And uh, so at, at the end, the, 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 the all will uh, follow this uh, very naturally, if you know exactly who is uh, who is funding and uh, what are the 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 objective of the funder. I do agree. Um, I would say to have a strong vision about where do you want to be and uh, and what do you want to do, but also to have some contingency plans as well. Um, so a balance between the two. Yes, uh, I would say that uh, it's all about excellence 
but uh, at the same time, I think it's very important as well to uh, uh, because uh, applying for these fellowships with the FNRS, you apply with a principal investigation investigator in one of the French-speaking universities. So I think it's very important to uh, to develop a relationship with this principal investigator as well to to know where you are applying. Usually also what comes up uh, in our commissions is uh, is the environment where you want to do your project uh, also suitable for your project. So are you going to thrive in this environment or not? So this sh you should also think about. Yeah, I would say first think about the PhD. Are you sure you want to do a PhD study? And uh, that's the very initial question you should ask to yourself. And make sure that when you do your internship, either in an academic lab or in a, in a company, investigate the company. Talk to your, to your manager. Try to see if the company is already involved in a SLIF program or not. And uh, if not, if yes, I think you, you may have chance. Uh, if not, investigate in, uh, in companies very close to uh, the topic that you are working on. I think everything that's been said is very important. I mean, I, I, would, I would agree with, with Oh, I would reinforce what's been said. It's very important to really have the link with, if, if you're going to a host lab, to have a good link with that host lab and to work with them on an application before, uh, before going too, too far. So really discussing with them a lot, but also asking for advice from your mentors where you are now. I mean, they can really help you with your project, help you build it, help you with the coherence. So really don't hesitate to ask around you and to use your network, that's what I would say. Yes, um, I have a specific question to uh, uh, um, Professor uh, Gia from uh, INRT. Um, I, I work, I'm the Deputy Director for International Relations at uh, the University of Poitiers and I'm also NCP for Marius Kodowska Curie Actions. I, in the framework of our cooperations with Mexico, we heard that there used to be uh, CIFR Mexique, and I was wondering whether there would be, uh, is it still in the discussions? Is it going to uh, be materialized, or is it something which has not uh, been finalized? Yeah, I think um, uh, we used to have um, discussion with Mexico um, to see if there's any opportunities to build a partnership between both countries. Uh, in fact, we, we do have an experience with Brazil, and unfortunately, the Brazil experience just stopped because the Brazilian government decided to stop the program because of fundings. Um, such program is very uh, ambitious initially. There's a lot of uh, uh, good, good energies to start the program, but when you definitely needs to find companies. You look behind you and there is nobody, to be honest. So not that much people to follow the program. So um, the experience with Brazil make us very a little bit skeptical to build additional programs. We do have one with Morocco, but it's slightly different from the Brazilian one in a way that uh, with Morocco, this is a co-funding. 50% is funding from France and 50% is funding from, uh, from Morocco. Um, so it's a little bit different. It started last year and uh, I would say it, it goes slowly, but it goes in a good direction. But for the time being, we don't have any additional project with, uh, with the other countries. If there is no more question, uh, I think we are going to close this panel discussion. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting to get information about the available uh, funding schemes for PhDs and postdocs. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I want to uh, thank you all for coming for this event. Uh, we hope uh, you get the information you need to prepare your mobility in Europe. I suppose most of the speakers and exhibitors will be happy to connect with you, so don't hesitate to connect with them on social media, for example. And I would like to address my thanks to all uh, the IBG team for the support they gave me, especially in the last few days. Thank you very much, and see you maybe uh, next year. <laughs>